Hi guys, God's side again for the sad truth. I have a very interesting guest today that I only heard about last week. Uh, my fans are always very good at identifying new voices in this important battle of ideas. And someone wrote to me saying, you have to check Muhammad al Khadra's uh, speech at the Secular Conference 2017. I think it was in, in England. I checked it out. It was a 10 minute talk and I thought, okay, I got to speak to this young man. How you doing, Muhammad? Oh, I'm really good. Thank you for having me. Uh, I'm going to tell you in Arabic first. Do you understand the language of the Lebanese? Of course. Of course, it's a lot. Is there a Lebanese in the Urdun? A little bit. A lot of now. Ah, a lot of Syrians. Okay. So, we've been talking to you today. I'm going to talk to you today. Thank you. Uh, I basically said, uh, it's nice to, to meet you. Uh, I asked him if there were some Lebanese people in Jordan. He said, no, there are very few, but they are mainly uh, Syrians. Uh, I said, I'm happy to meet him. And here we go. So, Mohammed, maybe you could begin by telling us about your background, where you were born. You come from a, a Muslim family and then how you decided to leave the faith. Give us the trajectory. Okay. I was born in the States. Uh, and we moved back to Jordan when I was like one years old, so I never got the chance to, to see it or to live there. Uh, I come from a moderate Islamic family. They're not too radical and not too open-minded. Uh, I became I, I like in the first years that you were born, you were brought up as a Muslim, so I I was immediately a Muslim. Uh, I was, a, I like my family, a moderate one, but when I reached college, I decided to be, to, to study it well and to be a Muslim out of studying it, not out of being brought up to it, to the religion. So uh, I began to study sects and then other religions and then uh, theories on science, etc. And then I found uh, a YouTube video of Richard Dawkins and then that, that opened up a new theory for me that I have to go back now to Islam and study it again, but this time without giving it any holiness or to give the book any glorifying things. I just look at it in a skeptical way. And I had a theory that, okay, if if, the, if uh, evolution is true and if all this is true, I have to find flaws that I didn't find when I was glorifying it. So I studied it back again, and then I found the inhuman and the, the mistakes and the, the incorrect stuff, and then I decided, okay, this is the right choice. So is it the fact that you couldn't reconcile evolutionary theory with the Islamic narrative that caused you to question the, the faith? To question the, the argument of design. Right. But, but destroying that argument doesn't mean that God doesn't exist. Like, it's not just the only valid one. So I, I, to be able to at least leave monotheism, you'll have to find errors in monotheism itself. So when I was spent, I had like a lifetime believing in Islam, it was hard for me to just break it down just based on one theory or based on one argument being vanished now so I had to go back and see the flaws myself and then after finding them deciding that maybe it's deism but then I was too into logic and too into philosophy that all the, all the fallacies came out at once and that was in the end for me how long did it take from your first exposure to Richard Dawkins work to you you know fully and openly leaving the faith. How long was that process for you? It was a few months of studying sex and then a few months of religion. Then it was Richard Dawkins. So I was deeply involved in studying religion for months before finding the video. And after the video, it took about like, uh, I don't know, maybe a few weeks just to go back and check Islam. Just to, because I had already built a background about about what what do atheists say what do the christians say what does the what what's judaism uh, so i had already that in mind so it didn't take very much i was the 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 moment i saw that okay the evidence is obvious somebody here is lying it's either this guy or either like faith 
but then faith doesn't provide the answers that this guy is providing. This guy is showing evidence like you can see and you can touch and you can feel. While on the other team, the other side is just, you can't think about this. Stop thinking about this. This The devil that is teaching you this. And the other answers are completely... Not the devil, the Yahud, the Yahud. <laughs> <laughs> no, but the, the devil is, is trying to, to get into your mind and trying to, to get you out of, of Islam. Uh, so, so you, the the call for you to shut down your critical faculties that was the end. Like, okay, the, the the guy who says don't question the theory that I'm giving you is a guy with no theory at all. So, so the, when when it was faith doing this to me, I said, okay, faith is too weak to take in, into criticism or to take these theories because okay, maybe it's not based on evidence; it's just faith. So why glorify it? Why think faith is something good to have? It's not. Well, I think the, so I, the, the importance of your story, right? I mean, you're just a guy that just came on the scene recently, but the, important, the importance of highlighting your story is precisely because it demonstrates two points. Number one, the importance of access to information, right? It took your exposure to some inoculating factor, some vaccine against religion, in this case, Richard Dawkins, for you to start questioning things. And it also demonstrates how totalitarian ideologies who can't win in the battle of ideas can only win by taking all opposing ideas, competing ideas out of the game. And that's the only way that they can win. So this is why I think, you know, part of the power of your your story is it demonstrates why I do this, right? I receive tons of messages from all sorts of Muslims and ex-Muslims who tell me, you know what, I started reading your stuff, I started watching your videos, and you've got me questioning, right? Uh, so this, you are living proof of what the battle of idea can, can result in, right? <laughs> Thank you. I, I do believe that, that the, 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 con- the, the access to information and the access to opposite ideas is a way to change people's mind. It's not always about religion. The guy who has the craziest idea or the most fascist or dangerous idea could be right. We can't shut ideas off or shut people off or censor anything that that comes out of... If we censor the most provocative thing, we we are censoring ourselves to to gain a a few information that, that we couldn't have. Once we decide that, no, we can't hear this, we're putting ourselves prisoners in our own cage. It's not just that we're imprisoning someone else. So when we do that or when we allow that to happen, we, in, in regarding Islam, we're, we're doing a very dangerous thing because one or two guys might be possible terrorists. And when, when you get that access to information, you might save people's lives for them to ju- not just to be atheists, maybe just to get them to be a bit, a bit moderate or a bit secular. So it's a noble cause just to get the information to the Middle East and just to get people to learn, maybe just about science and just to, to think for all for their own. Not, we're not going to be thinking for them. You just have to, to click people to think for their own selves and to I, make their own. You mind. started the, I think, Jordanian atheist group or i'm not sure what the title is exactly in 2013 correct yes it's the atheist and agnostics community we we call the jack uh it's a group for for uh for atheists and agnostics to meet and to discuss uh, science and debates and and to help each other it was uh, there have there has been many facebook groups but this one in particular had uh, we had a certain date to meet in person, and it's 28 people showed up. I know the number is, is very small, but in 2013, to have 28 people from Jordan coming up and saying, hey, I'm the atheist next door, it was very awesome. The, the number grew up each and every assembly there. This was happening After, in Jordan? Yes, but the problem was was that uh, there was some difficulties, some issues with some people, so now it's like uh, let's just lay low. We were gonna be friends. We're gonna be like a, another family to each other, but we're not gonna be doing any activism. So some people are picking activism, and some people are just deciding to just leave it as it be. 
they don't believe that change is possible. And some people, like, like me, I decided to, to know, let's be active about it. So I can't like force everybody to just be active about it. But uh, And I can't blame them, but uh, it's now two separate ways to, in, in mainly the country here. Just so that the, the Westerners can appreciate the reality of taking the positions that you take in the Middle East, tell us again, because one of the things that I loved in your 10-minute uh, speech at the Secular Conference this past summer, which, by the way, I'll, I'll put the link to it in the description section for people to check it out, truly excellent and, and passionate plea. I, I loved your, I saw your indignation, your anger, which frankly I, I share because I've been warning people, I come from the same land as you do, and I know about what can happen uh, to people in those lands if you don't follow the line. And so I wanted for, for Westerners who, you know, accuse people of being Islamophobic and protecting Islam and something, Tell people, someone like you, someone who's born into an Islamic family, what happens to you in those societies for holding the views that you currently hold? Well, let, let's pick a bit moderate country as Jordan. Uh, you will not be put to death by the, by the, by the state's law. But uh, let's talk just about the law. Anybody can file a lawsuit against you. That to, to to pick to get the the word Muslim out of your ID card, and once they do that, you cannot go to the Islamic courts or the Sharia courts. And one in Lebanon, they have civil civil courts, and you can have a civil marriage, but you can't do that in Jordan. So, if you're married, you'll get forced to divorce your wife. If you're if you're unmarried, you cannot marry. You cannot inherit. You lose your all all your civil rights because there is no civil court. And that's the smallest thing that could ever happen because the threat doesn't come from the state. The, the, the threat comes from the society itself, from the families, from, from the community itself. Even if the family is moderate, you get the threats from the society itself. The, uh, I have a friend who, who's now in, uh, he, he went to Lebanon, from Lebanon to, to Canada. He, he's Khalaf Abu Khalaf. Uh, he were, his family was okay with him. He, they weren't that much they didn't care that much about him being an atheist even though that he was an imam but the more larger community of his family were shocked by his views and that he's gay and now he's an atheist as well so they put pressure on his own family to kill him and that's what they tried to do we were a few hours from from his death we managed to get him to, to a safe house and leave the next day to lebanon and afterwards he got to canada so it's not just the family, it's the community. Anybody can be a threat. Anybody who knows about you or knows where you live or where you, where you work. It, uh, there's a joke at my job. They joke about it. They, they say, okay, I'm going to date this girl or I'm going to sleep with this girl. And they, they were hanging around and I was there. So one of them said, but we'll go to hell because like you, got, you drink and you, you sleep with women and you have relationships. So a guy joked, and I was just standing there. He said, "But we have Muhammad al Qadr here. We can, we can kill him. Get, we can kill him and get to heaven." <laughs> that, <laughs> that these are your, these are your co-workers. So let's, so let's not start about the community itself. Uh, al kafir wa Allah bi'balak. Allah bi 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 khfirlak bi al jannah. Exactly. Uh, kill kill the unbeliever, and God will sort of forgive you and take you straight to heaven. So yeah. in a sense, they had a direct highway to heaven by simply hanging yeah. around with through, me. Through my own head. Well, you're a very nice guy. Uh, yeah. So I rem one of the stories that I also remember from your uh, short speech, which I, again, I thought it was very poignant, was when at one point you were walking out somewhere and you, you'll, you'll tell the story better than I will. And uh, some ex-Muslim wo woman told you, please take off the tag because it says ex-Muslim or something. And you said, but why? We're in London. And then she said, yeah, but we're going to be passing by some uh, Muslims. Is that, yeah. did I get the story correctly? Somehow. It was, uh, let me just say, it was my first time outside of a Muslim country. I only went to Jordan and Syria. So when I flew to London, it was, I had this idea that finally I'm going to be where Richard Dawkins is, where Christopher, the late Christopher Hitchens was. So it's, for me, it's a free world, a free country where you can, say and do and wear whatever you want. You can be gay in public, you can be an atheist in public, you can be a Muslim in public. So when I reached there, it was, 
ex- I was extremely passionate by by people just living and smiling and doing whatever. He, a, a guy can kiss a girl in the middle of the street. You can't have that in Jordan as well. <laughs> For so the ex-Muslims of North America had the this sticker that says "Awesome without Allah." Right. So I, yeah, I had that sticker on my chest, and we we left that day and we went to dinner. There was a few ex-Muslims with us, so we went to this Turkish place uh, to eat. And then uh, this girl, she was with us at the conference, and she's an ex-Muslim herself. She just grabbed me and she took it off without even asking. She took she took the sticker off. So I was in shock, like, okay, what's going on? So I, t- I asked her, why did you take it off? She said, because th- this is this in this place there are Muslims, so we might get into trouble. So we better be off, you better be off it. She didn't even ask me for to, to 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 take it off, so it was a shock for me, and I was so upset. Not just because uh, that she did this, it's the whole mindset that I had when I arrived to London. Like, okay, I'm in a free country, and to see that, oh, okay, this is how far it has gone. This is how far the the Islamists have reached. They have reached a point where an ex-Muslim can censor another ex-Muslim just to be to to to, to have. Uh, to be safe or to be to be to stay alive or to be out of problems this is the exact thing that a mafia could do right and to have that in a country where you believe that you won't ever have to do anything like that it was very shocking and very problematic to me uh, I had faith in the West and I lost it when I was there. It was only four or five days, and I lost that faith. You should, from you the should, come, to Montreal, I hear. You should come to Montreal. You'll lose it even quicker. <laughs> but go on. Yeah, I, I thought that, okay, at least we're winning in the West. Uh, then I found out that, no, we're actually winning in the Middle East, and we're losing in right. the West. Because th- there are this huge po- uh, percentage of the country is standing with let's censor some words and let's censor some speech and that's hate speech if you criticize a certain religion nobody's shouting saying hey i believe your religion is practically hate speech let's censor that let's get let's get the, this word out of the bible or out of the quran nobody's saying that everybody's attacking those who are victims themselves and everybody's at what you like I, I always tell people this, you want to talk sensitivity? Well, let's do it. Let's talk sensitivity. Let's talk about the sensitive feelings of people, of Nahid Hattar who got killed. Let's talk of sensitive feelings of Boya Ahmad who, got, who had to watch her husband being butchered in front of her, to have her hand, the fi- her, her four fingers cut off and, and machete scars on her head. Let's talk about those sensitive feelings instead of the sensitive feelings of people being so upset about uh, their religion being offended out of cartoons. Well, if they are so sensitive and if they believe that religion, their their faith is being offended and, and criticized for being for being violent or being fascist, they should be up on the streets, millions, not protesting cartoons, protesting the actions of those terrorists who are actually offending their peaceful religion. Are you seeing that in Montreal or in London no. or in France? No, I'm still, I'm still looking for that demonstration. No, you won't have it because deep inside they all know that this is the right thing to do. And a guy asked me in a previous interview, he told me, we'll do more. What do you say to those who say it's a small percentage of radicals? Well, regarding Sharia law ruling all of the world, there are just people who are active about it and trying to get it. And there are people who are just waiting to vote on it in some election or something like uh, an islamic political party who reached it there and they will support it well, so there's it's, it's just the uh, active uh, actives and supporters and, and for passive, me. yeah uh it, i want i was going to mention i don't know if you know this but in canada right now we have are you familiar with motion m103 does that do you know what that is i heard there's a motion to censor some speech yeah so so it. uh justin trudeau uh, excuse me Grand Mufti Justin Trudeau <laughs> has Allah uh, uh, has uh, I mean really it's pretty much all he cares about is protecting the sensibilities of uh, of Islam and so uh, with one of his Pakistani uh, Canadian parliamentarian 
she put forth a motion. A motion is not yet a, a bill, but it's the first mm-hmm. step towards heading towards a bill where she specifically used the word that we have to, you know, have mechanisms to fight against legally against Islamophobia. Uh, and at first they said, oh, no, it's just a motion. It's just symbolic. And now that motion is being heard in the Senate and in Parliament, which, of course, is well on its way to eventually becoming likely becoming a bill. So, for example, the conversation that you and I are having right now, if someone decides that that is offensive to Islam and is Islamophobia, then, of course, that would be considered hate speech and uh, we would be in trouble. What do you tell absolutely lobotomized? Lobotomized means okay? What do you say to people in the West who simply can't understand the long-term play of what is happening to the West? How can we wake them up? Okay. Just to talk about the long term, as you said, I believe that we're either going to be toward a much more free world or we're going to something really, really bad. As far as I can see and as far as the motions that you're talking about, we're going into the bad direction. This is what's going to happen. You're giving people so many rights that they don't even should be having. And once you are giving them those rights, you reach a point where you will say that, no, I won't give them this. And actually, I'm going to take one back. I can't see you probably. Maybe we lost connection. You can't see me? Can you see me? Can, can you hear me good? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Now. It's okay? Okay. Go on. Okay. It's, okay. So uh, you're giving them so much rights and uh, that they don't even deserve. And once you decide that, okay, I'm not going to give you this or I'm going to take this back, you'll not be faced with some extremists. You'll, you'll have the, these minor communities of Muslims feeling oppressed. And once they feel oppressed, you'll have a much larger reaction. And with that reaction, you'll have the government putting on another reaction of taking more of those so-called rights. So it's going to be escalating into not just having one terrorist attack each month or each year. You'll be having terrorist attacks all day long. Like we have in Europe. Have, like we have in Europe. Yeah, because you have communities now feeling oppressed, not just a small sect of Salafis feeling that jihad is the only way. And with the, with the censorship and with the selling the term Islamophobia as the Islamic Brotherhood is selling it, and they started it a while ago, putting Islam as, as, as a race and selling that idea that it's forbidden to, to ask questions and to criticize it, it's just the way that fascism works. They, they put on an idea and you cannot question it, you cannot talk about it. This, this, as I said in London, you have freedom of speech. It's something so precious, and you're selling it out just to be too nice and just to be pleasing to to the enemy that's looking to take away your own rights and your your own achievements. Do you want to have an Islamic state in Canada? If you do not want it, just do not obey to Islam and give it the grounds to oppress more and more people and to oppress ex-Muslims like us and to put the, the guy who says I should uh, I should be killed I give him every right to say that but at least give me the right to defend myself and say that no I should I, I shouldn't be I should be alive and I be, should be speaking against you call out your enemies call out those who want to destroy your own society you have the most brilliant and beautiful ideas about how a community should live and how a country should be run you're taking the first steps of losing that they're not just fighting you with bombs and suicide bombers they're fighting you in a battle of ideas and you're helping them with shutting down our own fight back and our own ideas just to be nice to them and to be to to appease to the enemy who went who will not appease to you if he was in your own position well, as you probably know, several Muslim uh, leaders and theorists have said, and I've mentioned this on several shows, that uh, we are, this is the, the Muslim speaking, we are going to conquer the West in three ways. 
we're going to conquer it through the womb of our women, right? Demography. Yes. We produce five children, you produce less than two. We're going to win over the long term. We're going to conquer you through hijra. And I'd like to talk about that in a second, about immigration. And number three, we're going to conquer you by using your miserable freedoms against you. They advertise this. They say it clearly. They tell you what they're going to do. And yet the West keeps sleeping and calling everybody who says anything as a hateful Islamophobe. It is so frustrating because you see before your eyes your society slowly going to the abyss of infinite darkness and there's nothing you could do about it right you stand and you scream and you shout and you warn them and you say listen to muhammad al khadra listen to gad Saad, listen to people who've grown up in those societies but there is always some white guy who lives a privileged life in montreal or london tells you no 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 you're hateful you're an islamophobe it is maddening right yeah I it's, it's like history is, is, is coming back again. Everybody saw how Hitler took over Austria and how they took parts of Czechoslovakia and then he wanted a little part, let's have a little part of Poland and they saw what happened. They saw how fascism works and yet France and England were, okay, let's appease to Hitler. Let's try to have peace over in our time. But what did happen? If they acted in, in previous would the world war two be be the, in the way that it was? It was the voices that 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 are that are to, that, 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 that were saying that no war is coming. Let's try to prevent that, but not by appeasing to the enemy, by fighting off the enemy's ideas. Those voices are the ones that should have been heard, and people seem to have not learned from yeah. all of this. They, you know, they say, okay, you will, you cannot shout fire in a crowded theater. But maybe, just give it one thought for people in Canada or the UK or in Europe as well. Just give it one thought that maybe we're really shouting fire in a really fire situation. There is a fire. <laughs> there is a fire and there's going to be a much bigger fire if you decide to, to just uh, to, to not let us criticize it, not let us face the thought by thought. Let's not... Uh, let's, uh, by not preventing us from moving a speech against a speech, the next level will not be speeches against speeches and will not be preaching against preaching. It's going to be a gun by a gun. And let's not reach that point. Let's just try to face it off while it's still talking. And in most countries, in, in Barcelona and in, in Marseille a few days ago, it wasn't just speech. It was knives and bombs. Well, in Edmonton two days ago, in Edmonton, yeah. Canada, and when I discussed this, a guy, his name is, I think, Muhammad Ali or something from uh, Egypt, wrote me a private message. He wasn't concerned about the innocent Canadians who were killed by a truck of peace, but rather he was concerned about the fact that I would, you know, insult his religion. It shows you what a cancerous, evil mindset it is, right? I look at Muhammad al Khadra. I could love him more than I love a Jewish guy. If the Jewish guy is a super religious guy who gives up reason, I have less in common with the Jewish guy than I have with Muhammad. By the way, if, in case you don't know, I'm Lebanese Jewish, right? So I might be more, uh, I, have, I might have more respect and in common with you because we share a similar love for secularism, for humanism, for uh, exchange of ideas than I would with the Jewish guy. In other words, I'm not going to love the Jewish guy by simply the fact that he is Jewish. I judge you on the merit of your personhood, right? And so I might have tons more love for Muhammad al-Khadra than I might have for a hundred different Jewish guys, right? How is that hateful, right? I am trying to protect the rights of all people, Muslim, non-Muslim, atheist believers, from living their lives with dignity and with freedom. What's hateful about that? Now, someone like you who comes from the Middle East can appreciate this, but imagine how angering it is for me to watch my colleagues. I'm a professor, right? I see my colleagues. They're not on my side. They're not on your side. They're on the side of Islam. It's unbelievable. Yeah, they're on the side of Islam, and and they're on the because. There has been a lot of racism in Europe and in the States and in Canada that, that people are just too afraid to be called a racist. They, they, they're more afraid to be called a racist than being called dead. 
<laughs> They'd rather see Absolutely. themselves die and see their whole civilization die. Just don't call me a racist. Well, okay, take it. Take the word racist because it's not a race. Hear it out. Let them attack you by words. At least keep your civilization and keep your secularism, keep your free speech, keep what's more precious to you. And they don't see it as precious. They don't know what it means to walk in the street and have to act as a Muslim every single day of your life and to have to act in a certain way and to hide and to live in a closet just to stay alive. They don't, they have never felt that or lived that. Try, and being, they a, try, to, try being a Jew in the Middle East. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. They never tried it and they, so they don't appreciate what they already have. And this is what I'm trying to say to them. Just hold on to it. I'm not asking you to provide any support for any ex-Muslim in the Middle East. Just at least keep your civilization, keep this model that we atheists in the Middle East look up to and say, okay, at least there is hope. There is half of the world who live in this such way. Now you have an ex-Muslim who comes to those countries and sees the opposite and sees, okay, maybe... Maybe I, I was wrong. Maybe the whole world is now conquered by the idea that you cannot say no and you cannot curse at an idea and, and at an ideology that is so poisonous that you should be cursing at it and you should be criticizing it. And th they say, no, it's not. Let's, let's not talk about it. It's just, sh it's even imprison people for saying anything about it. I want to actually, you mentioned something in your talk, which I also love, and I want to come back to Hijra in a second. But in your talk, you refer to just Islam, no Islamism, no radical Islamism and jihadism and also it's Islam is Islam, which is a point that I've repeatedly made. And a lot of these sort of reformers that are playing to the Western liberal ear by simply putting, a, I call it the magical ism heuristic, right? You put ism to a word, it makes it bad, right? Islam is beautiful, but Islamism is bad which of course yeah. Islamism is an inherent part of Islam. Political Islam is much of Islam, right? So yes. talk to us about this because a lot of people it's, don't appreciate that point. It's by nature political. The, the religion itself is by nature political. It wasn't in the very few years when Muhammad was in Mecca. But once he left for Medina and he established his state, it was political from that date on. Now, if, if, if modern Muslims don't want to believe that and they want to live in a secular country, th that's because they are good people. And there are good people who are happen to be Muslim. And there are bad people who happen to be not. So it's not about good and bad. It's, it's not about the people themselves. It's about the faith or the ideology itself. The ideology itself says that, okay, there is that, there is, they call it Diyar al-Harb wa Diyar al-Islam, the house of Islam and the house of war. So the House of Islam is the countries where it's ruled by Sharia, and the House of, uh, of War is the countries that are not. In the House of War, you're forbidden to live there unless you're preaching Islam, and unless you're trying to get some information, some knowledge, some technology, some studying, or or you, you are fighting them there. So they they see you as the enemy. But but they but most Muslims will not take that into consideration. But it's the problem is that it's a ticking bomb. Like I was a moderate Muslim, and then I said, okay, let's study sex. And and once I studied sex, I said, okay, maybe Salafism is the right path because Salafism says that okay, take the book for what it says. It means what it means, and it's the unalterable word of God. So once you study at that in that way, you are a radical. Once you you, pay, you take Islam for what it is and you don't try to cherry pick the peaceful parts or the nice parts, once you take it as a whole, you are a radical by doing that because there's so much extremism and so much violence in it. Now, the so beautiful, let me interrupt you. Sorry, sorry. So let me interrupt you. The incredible thing is you've studied Islam formally. You're obviously in Arabic. Your Arabic is your mother tongue. Arabic is my mother tongue. We both know Islam very well, but there will be a Western guy with a French name at some university who will tell us both that we are misunderstanding the otherwise peaceful message that we are reading. 
So he knows more, because usually when you don't speak Arabic, the way they get to you, they say, ah, but you don't speak Arabic. If you only understood Arabic, you would know it's all beautiful. But then you mm -hmm. come to guys like you and me, who Arabic is our mother tongue, but somehow they still argue we're not understanding all the love and beauty, correct? Yeah. The, 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 you, you could have a lot of beauty and you could have a lot of nice things. Let's, ha let's, let's give them this gift. Let's say it's 99% peaceful. But at least there is 1% that people might take as the literate word of God and use that to kill others. Just having that 1% says that, okay, let just open the window and throw the whole thing out. You can have manners without religion. You can have morality. You can, ha you can be a good person without religion. You don't have to take this guidance to violence and war and discrimination and misogyny and do uh, use that to live your life the offer of this certainty that you already know what you you have to know is an offer that is not worth having it's it's something that you shouldn't be taking as a gift it's something that you should be taking as a prison and the, the people who try to sell the word islamism are just trying to, to, to also be too nice or they are part imagine that was imagine that was <laughs> sorry i just coughed i had something in my throat go ahead it's just people who are trying to, to be too nice or if they are from the other side they're trying to deceive people to believe that no it's just a small percentage of terrorists or radicals selling the word Islamism or selling the word political Islam it's all means the same thing and as I told you before there are just people who are active about it and others who will just wait to vote for it you can't believe how many comments were supporting ISIS in in the Arab board at at news channels when 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 there's a news like a Jazeera when they put that ISIS have launched an attack against uh, Al Assad you can't believe the amount of comments cheering up for it and once they saw that okay maybe they're a bit too extreme and this caliph thing will not work once they thought okay ISIS is losing Everybody was like, okay, ISIS is not part of Islam. That's yes, right. They're, they're fake monsters. They are Kafirs. Right. Uh, if the you, caliphate won, if the caliphate won, you then would, they would have be true the millions exactly. of people supporting it. Well, I've had conversations with a lot of people where they ask me to provide them with quotes from different imams and so on. And I will give them all sorts of authoritative sources. And in every single case, they tell me that the imam in question is not a true Muslim. So you take a guy who is who's dedicated his entire life to studying Islam. I mean, Yusuf al Karadawi, right? I mean, the Sunni cleric who is arguably the most famous and knowledgeable and influential Sunni cleric in the world. I will quote something by him. The answer is, yeah, but I mean, he's no true Muslim. He doesn't understand true Islam. So, I mean, how do you fight against such impenetrable departure from reason. Do you have a magic recipe for that? I, I actually do. Okay, do let's hear look, it. Do, do not look at imams and do not look at Muslim figures. Hell, don't even look at the Baghdadi or the Zawahiri or Al-Qaeda. Don't look at their own thoughts. Just pick the Quran and pick the Hadith. <laughs> it, does that represent Islam? Well, if that doesn't, well, no, nothing does. And and Muhammad Sira also, of course. Yeah. So, so yeah, so yeah. Let's let's not talk about political figures or or, or religious figures. We don't we won't care about them. I, I don't care what an, an imam says. Let's say what the Quran says. Does it does it not say beat your wife? Does it not say that uh, that does the Hadith says that I shouldn't be put to death? Does the the, the in, in the the, the Sira or the, the the story life of Muhammad isn't it proven that he killed Ibn Kab who was who was just saying poetry against him? It, it does the, the it does that is that the hate speech that Canada is trying to prevent and to do what the prophet does? Well, actually, you are right. You have a prime minister who is a bit mufti, so <laughs> so. So just don't look at what the public figures say because they will answer you that they don't represent Islam. Just bring on the phrases and bring on the hadith. Bring it on and tell them that if, you, if this is not representing of Islam, then what does? Well, usually, bring... usually what they will answer, now it doesn't work as well on me or you because we speak Arabic, but usually what they'll say is, 
I mean, yes, on the surface, it looks like it says kill, 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 take a break for an espresso, resume killing and raping. But that's because you don't speak Arabic well. If you understood Quranic Arabic, you know that it is meant as an allegory of kill with caresses and love. You Islamophobe, okay. if you knew true Arabic, you knew, you'd know that it's not killing. It's killing okay. with caresses. What do you say to those people? Okay. The, in the Quran itself, it says that it is a message not for certain people and that God sent previous messages to certain people, sent people to, 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 to Israel or to, to the people of Egypt or to Christians. It, he sent specific messages to specific group of, groups of people. But this time, in this book, I'm going to be talking to the to whole humanity in all languages, in all communities for the whole from this time to the end of times. So and he keeps stressing that it's not a mystery book. He keeps stressing that it's not uh, where it clues and you have to interpret that or this. So he keeps saying that this is a simple word for anybody to know. So it should be a simple translation of the text that will guide you through the happiness and gloriness in heavens. So just a simple translation is enough for you because God himself says that in the book that he's going to be making very simple for any community in any country or any language to, to, to learn it and to live by the rules that he's putting in this book. So that's my answer. So it shouldn't. So so the idea that oh you're misinterpreting, misunderstanding, mistranslating is nonsensical because by definition it's meant to be a very simple guide to follow for all of you, yeah. humanity. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Just, just do the, what what people do in studying other religions' texts. They uh, when when he's when people dan try to dance around the meaning of beating your wife, for example, it says that if she's not obeying you. Uh, don't sleep with her, sleep in a, in a separate room or don't talk to her. The second thing is, to, no, first you have to advise her. And the second move is not to sleep with her and talk to her. Then it says to beat her. Yes. They come and say, okay, it's not beating, it's just a pat or something. <laughs> okay. But if we are escalating the, the reaction to this woman yes. and saying, first advise, then don't talk, then beat. Does it look like a pat on Caresses, the back? Caresses, right. Exactly. It does not look like a pat on the back. Just read the whole thing, the whole text. You'll understand anything that 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 that, that a guy says. Okay, you'll have to get Arabic <laughs> to know this and that. Uh, t tell me quickly, since we're talking about some of the contents in the Islamic uh, holy books, uh, tell us a bit about your experiences growing up in Jordan with the Jew hatred. <laughs> that, that's all I need as an answer, but go ahead. <laughs> okay. So, the problem is a bit political, but once you study history, you'll see that the, the, the anti-Semitism is there from the beginning. But, but, but they look at it now and they say it's all because of Israel and what Israel is doing. And I'm not saying that uh, I'm not getting into politics and, and to judge what they do and, and, and what they don't. But the, the, the main idea is those are, as the Quran says, that these have been turned into monkeys and pigs when, when God uh, cursed them. So they, they see them as filthy people, as cowards. Like uh, it says in the, in, I don't know, I remember if it's in the Quran or the Hadith. Oh, I think it's in the Hadith that when the end times come, People, uh, the Jews, the Jews will be hiding behind a rock, and the rock will say, "Come on, Muslim! There's a Jew behind me. Come and kill him." Exactly. So uh, this this whole glorifying of killing Jews and 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 putting an end to their lives, and even they talk about that when Omar al khattab was in liberating liberating Jerusalem from the Christians. They say that he made the most peaceful agreement with them. He let them pray and he let them uh, enjoy their own religion. Well, there is a phrase in that that says that on one condition that they will not allow Jews to be to live in Jerusalem or to worship or to do any of that inside the holy city. 
So the Jew hating has been going on since day one. And you see how systematically Muhammad attacked the, the Jew tribes in Al Medina and tried to, to create any conflict with them to just get them out. And once the, uh, there's Yahud bin Quraida, yeah, you know them. Of course. Yeah, he he issued he issued a fat. Uh, it's like a fat one now. He issued an order to just kill all the the men, enslave or take as sex slaves the women and the children, or sell them out to buy weapons. And you talk about fascism, and you tell me it's Islamophobia. Well, that's what like that. That's what people don't understand, right? I mean, I tell them, look, it's a numbers game, right? It's a demographic game. You could have millions of Muslims who don't have Jew hatred in their heart. Although, if you look at historical realities, as you said, if you look at Pew surveys, you have countries that have 95, 97, 98 percent Jew hatred when when they're polled, right? How many Jews live now in all over the Middle East? None. What happened to them? There used to be tons of them. What happened to them over the past 400 years, right? So it doesn't take Einstein to understand it. You just have to ask somebody who's lived it. What happened to us in Lebanon? What happened to my brother-in-law's family in Egypt when they left Alexandria? They were Egyptian Jews. What happened to Iraqi Jews? What happened to Yemeni Jews? What happened to Algerian Jews, what, right? So, I mean, how much data do you need? So when I tell people... I have no hatred towards individual Muslims, not at all, right? Muslims wanted to kill us, and Muslims were also the ones who saved us, right? So, mm -hmm. so it's not as though I hate a guy called Muhammad al-Khadra, but do I have the right as somebody who comes from a history to say, well, with increased Islam, is it going to go well for Jews or not? Is it going to go well for gays? Now everybody loves J uh, LBGTQ uh, rights. Are the rights of the LGBTQ going to be improved if there's more Islam or are they going to be worsened? So it's a very simple equation. I always tell people, look, at the end of every day, I could weigh myself. And one of three things has happened. I either put on weight today, my weight didn't change, or I lost weight. There is no other possibility. So by the same analogy, when Islam comes to a new land, there are very few possibilities. Either the society becomes more free when Islam comes nothing changes or the society becomes less free as someone who comes from jordan can you tell us what happens if islam increases in a society well you can see it by looking at pictures of of egyptian and afghanistan women and iranian women when when they were ruled by a bit uh, just a little bit secular uh, monarchies or countries and presidents and then when pol when the politics when when the political compass turned into Islam, how change into, into the community was in Jordan. We, the, uh, my mother keeps telling me that they were they used to wear skirts and they used to to go out. And, and now all I look when I when I was in college is is, is hijab and it's niqab and it's people growing beards and a large number of Salafis that they didn't exist as my father and mother till, till told me in the previous 20 years or 30 years. It's just exploded into this sudden move back into Islam because what the Islamic Brotherhood keeps selling is that Islam is the solution. Once you grab into Islam, the whole community will rise and you'll have that imperial Islamic caliphate back again. These are not uh, peaceful uh, thoughts or peaceful parties they they keep telling that they are against american imperialism and israel is imperialism but they want their own empire and their own imperialism they they they're not against conquest they're only against conquest if it's another country if it's right. their own they're much more favor of it right uh, what do you think of hijra so immigration so someone like you, who obviously would be someone that uh, should be welcome in the West, you come from an Islamic background, but who cares? You are somebody who would be very uh, consistent with the values that we hold dear, secularism, humanism, uh, free thought, and so on. Uh, how do we strike a balance, right? I'm, a, I'm an immigrant, right? Uh, I wouldn't have wanted them to shut the door on me, so I appreciate the value of having a humane immigration policy, but I also recognize that you can't have 
millions of people allowed in, most of whom don't share any of your cultural values. So what do you have? Have you given it some thought as to how do we strike that balance between being humane and not committing cultural suicide? Well, I, I gave it thought, but, but I can't find that, that, that striking balance, as, as you said, because if you, if you don't allow people in, that's a shutdown of your own principle. And if you just open the gates, still it is a problem, as you see in Germany now. So for me, I, I don't believe that even a background check is possible. Because if you do a background check on me when I was like just moderate, you would let me in. And once I became like a bit more extreme and believing that, okay, we should have that caliphate, I would be thinking that when I will, when, when I will be in your own country. So, and to ban me is, is, is just giving them more uh, of the feeling of being oppressed or look at what they are doing to, to our own children and daughters. So I just can't figure that out. I can't figure a way where you can stay on your principles and still defend yourself. The, the balance between like privacy and security, I can't find that as well. I would say, they, I'm sorry, go ahead, go ahead. Finish your thought. Yeah. They, struck, they struck you in a way that you cannot defend yourself regarding immigration and regarding the, the balance between safety and privacy. The attack came from a very certain point where you cannot deal with it. You're just standing there and they are just breaching in. And I'm afraid of the point when they breach too far or when you try to defend too far and then the reaction will come. Look, my thinking is this. Number one, the numbers have to be sufficiently small that demographically it could never cause a threat to the indigenous culture. Do you follow what I mean? Mm -hmm. So, and, yeah. and there are very easy mathematical, you know, equations that you could enter that allow you to say, what should those numbers be? In other words, you could say, we're always going to be an open society and allow people to come in from any background whilst ensuring that the character of our host nation is never under danger demographically. If that number means you only let in five, so be it. If that number means you could let in 50,000, so be it. And then at that point, you always ensure that no religion, and certainly no religion that is a supremacist religion, is ever given a single inch within the public sphere, right? So you wish to practice your religion, do it in the privacy of your home. The second that you intrude on the right of a third party, you're not allowed to have that right. And if at mm -hmm. least you impose these two restrictions, then you could go a long way towards being both a tolerant and open society, but also recognizing that we live in the real world. And in the real world, all religions are not equal. All cultures are not equal. And just like Saudi Arabia has a right to protect its culture, we have a right to protect our own. Does that seem reasonable? Yeah, I, I, uh, there was a news today uh, about Germany putting on, uh, uh, you, you have to take a course in German culture once you arrive to Germany, and you're obliged to take that course. Maybe it's, it's a way to improve things, but what I noticed today was a, a news about Austria banning the, the porka, and comments from the Arab world was like, it's their own country, let them be. Why go there and have your niqab on? There was a bit of a secular nice. uh, sense in these comments. Yes, I, I, as I said in London, the, the, the improvement is coming from the Middle East. It's not coming from Europe. In Europe, they preach hatred. In the Middle East, the young people are getting more and more secular. So I, as I told them, the tsunami is coming from us. I looked at these comments and people were saying, okay, Saudi Arabia have a right to force the burqa. Why shouldn't Austria force people to, to, to remove it? So I so hope in that. And maybe the, the immigration of young people is now the, the right answer. Or, or the, the people, if you can do this background check on young people, maybe young people are the hope for... Although, for as you said, 
right? You went from moderate to extremist back to atheist. And the only thing that allowed you to navigate from, you know, nice to less nice is the fact that you interacted with the contents of those books. So even if you let in all those young people who are the hopeful, you know, humanist folks, then you don't know when they one day go to the mosque and it's a particular sermon in the mosque and boom, I'm now back to being a bad guy. So in other words, it's not about individuals, right? I don't care about Muhammad. I care about the ideas that go inside Muhammad's head. I have no love or hatred to a guy called Muhammad. He's an individual. But I am allowed to say, I don't want ideas that are contrary to our secular, liberal, modern values in my country. Why is that such a difficult thing for people to understand? Don't we have the right to decide which ideas we want to live by and which we don't? Yes, but uh, will will we censor the imams and the, and the the political parties or the Islamic communities in Canada or in the states or in Europe? Will we censor them and say we you cannot say so, like can a guy come to the street and say I believe that the the British police should be put to death or we should cut off the heads of the UK policemen? Will we would we not allow this? To happen i believe we should i believe that you should let them speak so, up. so you're willing to go as because I'm, I'm very much of a free speech absolutist in other words i think that yes. we should allow except maybe where i might even be less of a free speech guy than you is i think that we do have to draw the line as direct at direct incitement to violence so for example when the imam comes to the mosque and starts uh, the sermon about the extermination of the jews then no, that's not acceptable, right? So you could say whatever you want as long as... You could say, uh, I think Judaism is a bunch of garbage. It's a garbage religion. I think it's absolute nonsense. I hate Judaism. And that's perfectly fine. But if you say, hey guys, let, after we finish the sermon on Friday, let's go out, look for the Jews and kill all of them. No, you're not allowed to say that. But you think that you should be allowed to say that? Yes, I believe, I believe you should. Because... Let, let those ideology, ideologies show for what they really are. Let wow. people inside death and inside... Yeah, let them speak up and let their voices be heard all over Europe. And then let's see what the reaction will be of those who are trying to cut off, the, the, to bring on the, the term Islamophobia. Yeah, let them speak. Let, let them gather in the streets and right. say, let's kill Muhammad al-Qadran. Let's kill the Jews. Let them say it out loud because... It, as I as I told you when we began, we're putting a cage for our own selves. The guy with the most extreme word that that comes of his mouth, and he says, "Let's kill the ex-Muslims or let's kill the Jews." I'm sorry, but there is it must have taken him at least some effort to say what he's saying. Maybe, maybe, maybe he has one percent of truth or wisdom. Or maybe it will just let us think that, okay, why does he say this? M maybe all the ex-Muslims should die, or maybe all the Jews should die. Let's just think about anything, any harmful idea. Let's wow. give it a thought. You're and even more, you're more, I, I have found the guy who is even more of a free speech absolutist than I am. <laughs> Congratulations. Uh, give, give, him, give him the right to say it, and give yourself the right to respond to it. Right. But don't don't give him the right to say it and shut me down and censor me down and tell me no I cannot object to what he's offering or what is he he's saying. Right, you're basically saying look shine the light on the hatred so that that yeah. way instead of it being underground let me know who's the guy who wants to kill me basically. Yeah, I, I understand that. Uh, two more quick questions and then we'll wrap it up for today. Number one, a personal one if you don't mind answering, how has your family responded to your activism? Well, first of all, my mother thinks until now that I am a Muslim. Uh -oh. And, uh -oh. and I, I, brought, I brought up the, the, the coming for to, like maybe I, sh I will be leaving Jordan soon or not. I don't know. So I brought this up and she said, okay, if God is with you, you're, you're gonna be you're gonna be doing good. And I was thinking that, okay, Allah she, manna she, mai, Allah tarakni. If you if you th if you know what I'm gonna do once I leave the country, <laughs> uh, you won't be saying this. Uh -oh. So she's she's a bit old. So you know how she thinks that 
that that her, how would how would she feel if she thinks that her son is going to to hell? But um, uh, this is regarding my family, and uh, my father passed away before I was I became an atheist. This uh, so it wasn't like very difficult for for the family issue. Uh, the community, as I told you, we had jokes at work, and the, the, they're not too hostile. Uh, Jordan, and, and especially the, the western side of the capital, is a bit secular, and there's a secular movement, secular parties, and we have secular members in the parliament as well. So it's taking a few steps forward, so it's not th that much of a dangerous place to be in. Once you move to the eastern part of the city or to other cities, you face more and more radicals and as my friends and 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 people uh, who are in the group or out of the group like not hatter died and and khalifa khalifa i told you about and many cases there was physical threat but it depends where the family stands and where the community stands some families are okay with it and some families are not if 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 i was a woman and the family knows about it they, I will be surely put to death because they they don't see us just as people who are rejecting Islam. They see us as people who are immoral. You right. can't believe how many times I have been asked, asked, why won't I sleep with my own mother and sister? He said, many people ask us this question, why would you sleep with her? Because you, you have no guidance, you have no morals, right, right, why right. won't you do it? Yes, because so, oh, so it's only because it's, you have to believe in God that I don't now go and have massive sex with my 83-year-old mother. That's the only thing stopping yeah. me from having sex with her. Yes, and I keep responding to them like that, but they don't, they don't get it. So for a woman to be an ex-Muslim and her family knowing about it, it's a very dangerous thing because they think, okay, it's the, the family honor that will go down. She will Every time she goes out, she's sleeping with men, she's sleeping with everybody on the street. So it's very difficult for the woman, not that difficult for the man wow okay final question are there any projects that you're currently working on that you're you'd be willing to share publicly or you're yes. not ready yes yeah the greatest and i'm gonna pack a cigarette for this because it's gonna be the hugest project ever made Yalla. for atheists Tell us and ex-muslims in the entire world okay so After the conference, uh, people were coming up with ideas and thoughts about, uh, about what they are going to do. And I came up with the idea, and we're working on it, and it's, it's a work in progress. It is the Atheist Day. We had this problem that ex-Muslims don't show up in the Middle East or in the Arab countries. They, you don't see them in the streets, and you don't see their faces, and you don't see anything about them. So, to, in order to give those people a voice, and as long as they can't say it for their own selves, we're going for an international atheist day for every major city in the whole world. We're going to pick a day and we're going to have a website for it. And people from the Middle East or countries that, are, that, that atheism is punishable by death or, or you can be imprisoned in will have to, to wear or do a, a simple symbol. Like there are women in Iran who are against the hijab and they wear a white hijab right. on that day to represent that they're opposing it. You, they're going to be wearing a symbol and that symbol shows that you are an atheist, you are an ex-Muslim, but you still can walk the street in a group of 30, 300, 3,000, whatever the number is, they're going to show up on that day. And in other countries where there is hopefully free speech and free word by that day, and hopefully you guys will keep that free speech until then, you, uh, atheists and ex-Muslims uh, internationally will be walking the streets and giving these people a voice. and and doing a protest for these guys and for all their own selves and meeting with other fellow atheists and ex-Muslims. On that day, we will represent that we, we're going to be like the new gays or the new LGBT because everybody cares about the LGBT community and nobody actually cares about the ex-Muslims community. Let's, let's do that. Let's have the West look at us as individuals who have rights. We have the right... To, to refuse to follow any faith and to refuse the dogmatic fascist belief of Islam and to have the right to criticize it and to, to be faced with the threat of death 
for that, let's have some, at least some recognition that we exist and we have those rights. And maybe, maybe we reach a point where when all those people gather in, in, in every city, we'll reach a point where we can support each other and we can all work as a single unit. Once we reach that, we will be achieving more and more because you see them in social media. You, you see them through Facebook and or through a YouTube video from a time to time. But you have never seen crowds and crowds of atheists in, in a man or Cairo or in Mecca. I bet that there will be an atheist in Mecca and, and just taking a picture of that little symbol and posting it online or sending it to us. I will give you a word that once this day is accomplished, you will see how many ex-Muslims and atheists are in Muslim countries and you'll see them wandering off the street with this little symbol of, of freedom that, that they're wishing to have and I'll be counting on the West to give these people the voice and to shout out what they're wishing to say on that certain day. That's beautiful. Well, you can certainly count on my support. I don't know if you can count on all the Thanks. West, but I will certainly do my part to protect your rights and the rights of all people to live a life of freedom and of dignity. Uh, I, what I want people to take away from today's message as we wrap this up is here you are, someone who is in the Middle East, who is taking unbelievable personal risks to speak out. And when I receive emails from people in the West telling me, hey, Dr. Saad, what can I do to participate? And then I give them some some possibility and they say, oh no, but my girlfriend will get angry. Then I give them a second possibility, oh no, but my Facebook friends will get angry. Then I give them a third possibility, oh, but I might get fired from my job. What I want them to remember is all the Muhammad al Khadras, all the people in the Middle East that have a lot more to lose than their girlfriend's love or their parents' love. They're putting their lives on the line so that they could live a life either with Islam if they want or without Islam if they want. And that's what we should remember. We should remember all the Muhammad al-Khadras that are putting their lives on the line so that they can have freedom, which we in the West take so much for granted. So there you have it. Uh, buddy, it's been a real pleasure speaking I'm to you. you voice. Did you hear my yes. whole, did you hear everything that I said? Yeah, I, I, heard, okay. I heard it. And I, and I want to say to, the, to these people, that the conversation of either the existence of God or free speech or the principle that the future of, of the human civilization counts on these conversations and counts on people defending the rights of others because once those others are gone, you will be defending your own. So to choose to be silent in a moment like this and in a fight like this that depends on the whole civilization, on the whole principle of the Western civilization, to shut up and uh, you go and shut up by your own. But we and people like you and people who believe that this is the fight that we should be fighting and this is worth living for, we're gonna fight this all the way. We're gonna fight this to the end. And if you wanna surrender, you do it by your own name. Don't do it on the name of Canada and don't do it by, on the name of law. Do it on your own. Stay in your home and decide that we should be put to death and that is something you should be quiet about it because death is coming for you if you choose to just let them have it their their way with us. They're going to have their way with you. Exactly. So you do it on your own name. We're just going to fight it off all the way. Shukran, Habibi. Dallak al-khat. Charrafna. Shukran, Habibi. Dallak al-khat. Ah.